So in this recording, now that we have an understanding of the taxonomic hierarchy, let's start to move through all the life that's out there, which is a lament that you're going to hear from me again and again over the next several lectures, in that there is so much out there, and I'm doing it such an injustice, but I do want to remember that this course is kind of a survey, at least a survey portion of the course, where we're going to touch on a lot of different things relatively quickly, so that you are aware of them and can start to build a bigger picture that then you can go back, learn more deeply, and um, build stronger connections. But we're going to try to at least establish a skeleton of kind of the relatedness of all of life. And so to make that point um, very poignantly, today we will cover prokaryotes. So in one lecture, we're going to attempt to cover the basics of two of the three domains, bacteria and archaea, and just a very, very skimming of the information that you would get if you were to go on and take microbiology or get a degree in microbiology or go on and get a PhD in microbiology. People study their entire lives some of the things that I will just mention in passing um, during this lecture and over the next few weeks. So do keep that in mind as we move forward. So the main points about prokaryotic life is that we are familiar with the prokaryotic cell. It is small, generally smaller than the eukaryotic cell, and that it is the oldest kind of life on the planet. Here are prokaryotes on the tip of a pin, right? So it's an electron micrograph. It's been colored, and it looks like a mountain, but in fact, that's the tip of a pin. And prokaryotes arose probably around 4 billion, 3.8 billion years ago. So because the Earth is only about 4.6 billion years old, it's about 80% of the age of the Earth that prokaryotes have been around, and we have not been around that long, not like that. So eukaryotes rose somewhere between, it's rough, between 2 and 1.2 billion years ago. So they are at least twice as old as we are. Um, they are everywhere, and that's the thing that we want to remember, that they are everywhere, their diversity is great. Again, here's a prokaryote versus a eukaryotic cell. One of the first things that you'll do um, when you do your project in microbiology where you take microbiology is identify an unknown. And the first step in that is going to be to isolate the different kinds of bacteria and the mixture that you're going to get. And the way to do that initially is what's called a streak plate. And so this is what you would do. You streak out the bacteria until at the bottom you can see the different shapes and the different colors of the colonies. These are bacteria grown on what's called an auger plate, which we'll look at in lab. Um, but then you can isolate pure colonies and then continue biochemical tests. Because we're going to talk about in this lecture, how do you identify a prokaryotic cell? There are many, many, many millions and millions of different species of prokaryotes, um, yet they're all these single cells, so how do you distinguish between them? And we'll look at some of the physical characteristics, whether they have pili, um, you know, or not. Those pili can be used in what's called prokaryotic conjugation. This is the closest thing that bacteria come to having sex. That is, they're exchanging genetic material through that pilus, um, and this is one of the reasons why uh, antibiotic resistance can spread so quickly, even among different species of bacteria. It's very interesting. More flagella, do they have flagella, do they not have flagella, do, do they have one flagellum or many flagella, right? Again, prokaryotes can live just about anywhere. They can survive extreme conditions. One example is Dinococcus radiodurans. This particular bacteria was discovered when they were irradiating food um, to kill and sterilize the food, yet this survived. And this thing can handle um, levels of radiation that would, um, that would kill a human being, right? So many, many, many times level of radiation. So it's interesting to study this organism and understand on a physiological, on a molecular level, how does it accomplish that? And that's information um, that is useful to us. They are very, very important in the global ecosystem. There are more prokaryotes um, by biomass than any other kind of life on Earth. So they are very, very successful. They've been around for a very long time. They're super important in a process called um, decomposition, right? So as we get into ecology and talk about energy moving through a system and trophic levels, in the background we always have what are called decomposers. And prokaryotes are going to be one of the first class of three B big decomposers that we're going to look at. So they're responsible for them breaking down organic matter, matter to recycle it so that it, the energy can move through the system again. And like I said, we'll talk about this more 
um, later, but I want you to remember that idea um, that they are big decomposers. So if you want to try to identify um, prokaryotic life, we have to start to look at the different criteria by which you can do that. And the first thing that you're going to look at is their shape. There are three most common shapes for prokaryotes, and they are spherical, which are also called um, coxis or plural cocci, and um, it's the Greek word for berries. So they may be round in shape. They may be rod-shaped, which is bacillus um, or bacilli. And then finally, they may be um, spiral-shaped, spirillum. So those are three um, major categories that you can put the shape of a, of a prokaryote into. But that by no means gives you the diversity to identify all the different kinds of bacteria out there. But it's the first thing to look at, and it's relatively easy. So I want you to know those three shapes. So how do you identify prokaryotes? First, by their shape. Next, by their cell wall structure. Now, when we talked about prokaryotic uh, anatomy, we talked about the plasma membrane being the kind of chemical barrier that defines the cell. And outside of that is built a cell wall. Now, if we look in finer detail, we actually look at prokaryotes and group them into two major categories, gram-positive and gram-negative. So if you are a gram-positive bacteria, you stain in this gram test that you'll learn when you take microbiology, um, purple. And this was developed by a guy named Dr. Graham, so he gets his name on the test. So gram-positive means you stain purple, and it means that when you look at the cell wall structures, you can see in this, um, this slide here that there is a thick, well, a thick cell wall outside of the plasma membrane. So that is that peptidoglycan material that we find, and I want you to know that, review that, peptidoglycan. It's a um, combination of protein and sugar, right, peptidoglycan. And if you're gram-positive, you have a nice thick cell wall outside of the plasma membrane. If you're gram-negative, you stain pink on the gram test, and you have a different kind of cell wall structure. In this case, you have the plasma membrane, and then you have a thin cell wall in what's called the periplasmic space. Now, that thin cell wall is still fine structurally. It does all the jobs that um, the cell wall needs to do, but then there's an outer membrane, another membrane outside of the cell. And so this does create kind of a space that we talked about as in eukaryotes that we can do specific chemistry. And so what we call that periplasmic space is kind of more like a porch around your one-room cabin, if you think of a one-room cabin as your prokaryotic cell. So some prokaryotic cells have this structure to their cell wall. So the next step in identifying prokaryotes is one shape, two cell wall structure, gram-positive or gram-negative. When we look at that, we can see here the gram stain. You can see um, the pink cells versus the purple cells, the gram positive versus the gram negative um, stain. Now, after that, it really comes down to biochemistry. So you then run your bacteria through a bunch of biochemical tests um, to identify it, or you just sequence the genome and say, oh, this is the, the genome that we identify. This is the DNA we identify specific with the species. But even in um, the microbiology classes that you'll take as an undergrad, you can start to run, you'll learn how to run and test all the different um, uh, metabolic tests. Now, we're going to run through a couple of these metabolic tests, so we learn some um, terminology that we're going to use later in the course as well as we look at different kinds of life. And that first one is oxygen dependence. So when we look at the metabolism of a prokaryotic cell, the first question we're going to ask is, ask is does it need oxygen to live? Is it aerobic? Um, does it, or does it not need oxygen? Does it actually want to be in the absence of oxygen? Is it anaerobic? Or is it a facultative anaerobic, which means it can switch between metabolisms? It can go and ferment, where oxygen is not present, or it can use oxygen and do aerobic um, cellular respiration to make ATP. So those are the three categories that we want to think about um, when we look at our bacteria next, is it aerobic? It needs oxygen. Is it anaerobic? There's no need for oxygen. Or is it a facultative anaerobic, meaning it can switch between the two metabolisms? Now, beyond that very simple biochemical test, there are numerous other biochemical tests dictating what 
a bacteria can use for food. And for this class, we're going to kind of break that down into the idea that they have incredibly varied biochemistry. And that's really the cool thing about microbiology is that like the biochemistry in these tiny organisms is, is really cool, like lots of funky stuff. So let's go back to wood. So remember that wood is cellulose. When we talk about carbohydrates, it's glucose. But glucose is linked in a way that we can't access. We can't break it down. But there's lots and lots of bacteria that can because they are decomposers. Why are they such good decomposers? Why can they break down all the wood, the cellulose that's produced? Because they have really interesting different biochemistry, biochemistry that we don't have. Now the other way then you can categorize as we continue to look at metabolism is how they feed themselves. Are they eating other things? Are they doing this major decomp decomposition reactions to, to make food and eat it for themselves? Or do they make their own food? If they break down things to eat, they are called heterotrophs. And we, in fact, are heterotrophs. Animals are heterotrophic. They are other feeders. So they obtain their carbon source from ingesting organic compounds from something else, some other living thing. Now, if they're not a heterotroph, they're an autotroph, meaning they make their own food. This is photosynthesis, like plants. So this is a picture of a cyanobacteria called anabina. And anabina is one of the most independent organisms on Earth because it makes its own food, it fixes its own nitrogen. It can do a lot of cool biochemistry. It's very, very independent. So if you're a self-feeder, you're an autotroph. You can synthesize your own um, organic compounds from inorganic compounds. So remember, photosynthesis takes CO2, inorganic carbon, from the air and makes it into sugars that then the organism can use to eat. Or other things eat it to get those organic compounds. So more specifically, if you're a phototroph like um, anabina, then you use light energy to fix those compounds. Cyanobacteria are the class, these blue-green algae, as we'll talk about a little bit later, um, as prokaryotes are, are very, very important as, photo, as photosynthesizers. So they are phototrophs. They make their own food with light energy. Now, a smaller category of autotrophs that um, are important and very interesting are called the chemoautotrophs or lithotrophs. Now, instead of using light energy, they use chemical energy to power their synthesis of organic compounds. These are the bacteria that are the foundation of the ecosystems that we find at the bottom of the ocean in like hydrothermal vents. They're using, they're literally eating raw materials, iron, sulfur, hydrogen, ammonia, nitrate, and using those to power their biochemistry. And that's a very unusual talent. So it's a chemoautotroph or lithotroph as that second category of autotrophs. So that's a lot of biochemistry that you can use to um, understand what, you know, narrow down what species of bacteria you may have. Now another kind of relatively simple test you can do is testing whether your bacteria has the ability to form what are called endospores or not. So again, some bacteria can withstand environments that are very hostile and the strategy that some of them take is actually to form this this spore. And it's an endospore. And so what they do is they dehydrate themselves and form this kind of seed-like coat around their DNA and proteins, and they can resist dehydration and extreme temperatures in that form. And then when things get better, then they can re kind of we literally call germinate and start growing again. So the ability to form endospores is unique to a species. Some species can do it and some cannot, and hence it is characteristic and useful in taxonomy. Now the other reason that we want to bring this up is because when, when these bacteria form spores, um, you can collect those spores. And that is the source of using them as a bioweapon. So if you remember from the news and stuff over the last several decades, people have talked about, oh, you know, they found white powder sent through the mail to blah, 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 blah. That white powder is oftentimes anthrax, which is a um, bacteria that if you inhale it into your lungs will form a, a, a blood infection that can kill you. And so what is that white powder? It's all the endospores of that bacteria that when you open the envelope or whatever, you get this cloud of white powder, you inhale it, and then in the warm, moist environment of your lungs, the endospores sprout and you get a horrendous infection and it can kill you. So that's the white powder. That's where that comes from. They're endospores. Now, 
one last thing that we want to talk about, and this is kind of going back to the idea that prokaryotes are actually two domains of life. So what is so different about bacteria from archaea, the two domains, um, that constitutes them being two domains, right? Why aren't they just all lumped together into some domain called prokaryota, you know? Well, what we found is that when we look at bacteria on a molecular level, um, the differences between archaea and bacteria are that archaea on their level of doing molecular biology are actually much more closely related to eukaryotes. So we've talked about eukaryotes having molecular biology with introns and exons in their gene structure. That's kind of more like what we see in archaea. So they kind of break the rule of prokaryotic gene structure being simple, but they are still clearly prokaryotes. But it's such a fundamental um, difference and so foundational to how the thing lives that we actually have to break it out into its own domain. Now the other thing that's cool about archaea is that they are oftentimes extremophiles. So heat-loving prokaryotes or salt-loving prokaryotes or acid-loving prokaryotes or alkaline-loving prokaryotes, we often find these as archaea. And so they live in extremes, so we call them extremophiles. And these were first discovered in hot springs, natural hot springs, where they thought nothing could live, but in fact they did find bacteria. And as they studied those bacteria more and more, they found that they were unusual, and many of the species that they found in these extreme environments um, were in fact archaea. So that's prokaryotes in a nutshell. Um, it seems like a lot of information, but in reality, it's not. Um, but it's a great place to start.